This evening's scripture reading is going to be coming from Acts chapter 8, verse 12. That's Acts chapter 8, verse 12. It reads, But when they had believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they are baptized, both men and women. Good evening, Charlotte Avenue. Thank you once again um, for being here. I want you to know that each and every one of you are an encouragement to me. I want to thank uh, the song leaders and also those who have read scripture today for the service that they provide, for the support that they provide in uh, bringing forth lessons from God's word. This evening, uh, to introduce this evening's sermon, you know, I was asked to provide a title. And, and sometimes that can be a bit of a struggle because you understand as a minister that they're looking for something short and concise and to the point, uh, something that's easy to publish, uh, you know, and, and put out in front of folk. And, and so I put preaching to bring about faith. And that indeed is exactly the direction of this evening's sermon. Now I want to go back and reflect briefly. Uh, you know, I use the children as my gauge. If they had aced every one of those questions Don had for them, then I would be confident that everyone in our assembly had absorbed this morning's lesson and walked away with all three points. But uh, I just want to go back and bring those points to the forefront of your mind because this is sort of a springboard type sermon. We're going to take and build upon what we had this morning. Uh, This morning we spoke about the prerequisites of evangelism. And the three points that were made is that we needed to recognize that souls are lost. That instead of looking around and seeing bodies and seeing faces, that we see souls. And that we understand they're either saved or lost. And the importance of that recognition. And what we owe, what we are indebted toward in that regard. We also looked at a second point. That when we prepare ourselves properly for evangelism. That we make a lasting commitment. And that we become properly prepared to do so. As a third point, we looked at whether or not, we looked internally and asked ourselves, do I truly believe that the gospel is the good news? Do I indeed believe that the Bible and the instructions given there are the only means to salvation? And so please do keep those three points from this morning's sermon in the forefront of your mind as we go through this evening's sermon, which is entitled Preaching to Bring About Faith, because as we recognize the fact that we need to evangelize and we recognize the fact that souls are lost and we offer our commitment and our preparation and we truly believe that the gospel is the good news, now we're getting to the and then part of it. And then, what do we preach? How do we develop faith? What do we present to folk? What should we base our speaking and teaching and preaching? And that's the part that I want to expand upon is, is yes, the title is preaching to bring about faith. But again, we talked about many different arenas and many different settings this morning from small children to graduates uh, to mature adults, uh, the unemployed, the employed, and and everything in between. There's so many different arenas for evangelism that I want to, instead of just sticking to that title, I want it to be, you know, speaking, teaching, and preaching to bring about faith because ultimately that's what evangelism is all about. If we look at Acts uh, chapter 8 and verse 12, it was just read for us. But when they believed Philip, as he preached what the good news. Now, the good news we went over this morning about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus. Then they were baptized, both men and women. So it was conditional. The baptism did not take place until they had received the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. And tonight, those are the two things that I want to hone in on. Those are the two things that I want to focus on. Is the keys to the kingdom and the power, prerogative, and authority of the name of Jesus Christ. When we think of the day of Pentecost and we look at Acts chapter 2, it gives us a great example of what to preach. 
Every word within that sermon was designed to awaken faith in Jesus Christ. And it received the appropriate response. Why? Why was it designed that way? It was there to motivate the audience toward faithful obedience. But what did the next series of evangelists do? Did they follow that very same pattern? You know, it's good to notice what the next sequences of evangelists did. How did they change? See, because that's what we need to be preaching today is what those eyewitnesses took with them. And as they were dispersed, what did they teach? What did they preach? Again, as we look about the text, Christians were scattered because of persecution. We covered that this morning, that there was a very dark time in the church where Saul was imprisoning people. People were being killed. Men and women were being taken from their homes. Men and women were fleeing uh, due to safety hazards and concerns, but they didn't go and hide. As they were scattered, they continued to preach because they were motivated, because they understood the importance of the message they had received. We find that in Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Then we also find Philip in a place called Samaria. And see, the Lord worked miracles through him. That was so the people would believe. There was a time when miracles were utilized, signs were utilized in order to help encourage and to get faith going. You know, we talked about that a little bit in Bible study this morning as well. And still some folk didn't believe. But many did as a result of those signs and of those miracles. And we find here that Philip indeed was able or empowered uh, to provide such signs and miracles as well. That's like Jesus. If we look in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Again, the emphasis tonight is about the name of Jesus Christ. The power that is in, embodied in that name of Jesus Christ and also the keys to the kingdom. That's what we're looking at. The keys to the kingdom and the power of the name of Jesus Christ. Mark 16 and 20 says, And they went out and they preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. Hebrews 2 verses 3 and 4 says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who had heard. While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So it was as appropriate as God saw it. It was God's design. Now the content of this next section of preaching is what's critical to us today. Because that's the pattern that we are to follow. See, so we, we go back to this point of Pentecost. We go back to this point and we see where the, the, the church is being early established and we see where there are signs and miracles and we see where faith begins to grow and begins to expand. But then we look at those evangelists, those speakers and teachers and preachers that followed shortly thereafter and the messages that they were carrying were those that concerned the kingdom of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, when they heard these things, they believed and obeyed. So it's because of what they heard about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ that they believed and they obeyed. Because we've been given the job today to be evangelists of the world. We're familiar with the Great Commission. We mentioned it, but blew past it this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20 say, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The scriptures tell us that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So when we consider Jesus and the power of his name, the very scriptures, the inspired word of God, tell us that the fullness of God, all of deity, was pleased to dwell in Jesus. So as we study his name and think of his character, and as we call ourselves Christians following the teachings and preachings of Jesus Christ, it's important to understand that he conducted himself in such a fashion that the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. See, people are too quick to make a separation and say there's the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and I don't dispute that one bit. But the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. And I don't think that's a point that we should miss as we study our scriptures. Mark 16, 15 through 16. And he said to them, go into all of the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news, to the whole creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And again in Luke 24, 46, and 47, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that the repentance and forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed, what? In his name. In his name. So it's still, it's all about Jesus to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Just like Philip, we ought to examine what the New Testament has to say about the kingdom of God, the keys to the kingdom, and the power of the name of Jesus. So let's look first at the things of the kingdom. There are dozens of scriptures about the kingdom of God. I've selected only a few. Let's look at John chapter 3, verses 3 through 5. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, what? enter the kingdom of God. The terms of entrance into the kingdom of God, John 3 and verse 7 says you must be born again, so it's condition. So we learn that the scriptures repeatedly put conditions on the keys to the kingdom of God. Acts 2, again, Pentecost, we think about the terms of pardon. Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you. What? in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is conditional upon the name of Jesus Christ. And again, this goes back to the terms of entry into the kingdom of God. Repent and be baptized. You'll be added to the church, it says in verse 47. Church corresponds with kingdom. In this particular regard, Matthew chapter 16, 18 through 19 says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you, what? The keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So we see here various aspects conditions regarding entrance to the kingdom of God and we see that they are fundamentally and foundationally built upon the name of Jesus Christ. So now what about the things concerning the name of Jesus Christ as we make a second point? It's a soul saving name. Matthew 1 21 the scriptures say that she will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. It's a name of ultimate authority. A name of ultimate authority. What do we find in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10? So that at the name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now see, that's just before it talks about Jesus not counting equality with God a thing to be grasped. See, he chose to lower himself, to take on the form of a servant, and to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what we're talking about here. And because of that humility, 
Because of that humble act of service, he is exalted. And because of that exaltation is every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? Me. So again, when we consider the name of Jesus and the power and the authority of Jesus, he says it all. Power and authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. So in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Peter says, I have no silver. I have no gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Another example of how powerful the name is. We're also baptized into his name. Acts 2 and 38, again, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, it's conditional and it's conditional upon the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 10 and 48 says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm intentionally being repetitive. Again, I want to make two points. The keys to the kingdom of heaven and the power and authority in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 19 and 5, on hearing this, they were baptized. How were they baptized? Into the name of Jesus Christ. Now, why is it important is it sincerely stop and, and, and slow your mind for a moment and ask, why is it important? Because well, there are various forms of baptism. We know that. As we look around us, we know that. As we think about our family members and our friends and our co-workers and, and for the children, the other kids at school, that there are many forms of baptism. But here, ask yourself, why is it important that the baptism is in his name? Well, what did we look at this morning in Bible study? What happened when healing was done in his name? When healing was done in his name, healing occurred. And so when baptism is done in his name, forgiveness occurs. The power of Jesus' name is never to be underestimated. We're not to beat around the bush. So as personal evangelists, keep that in mind that we need to go back and we need to look at the patterns that have been established along with the early establishment of the church. Look at those patterns. Look at those evangelists and what were they focusing on? The keys to the kingdom of God and the power of the name of Jesus Christ. And that does not need to change today. There's no reason we should be preaching anything else this morning, this evening, next Sunday. The keys to the kingdom and the power of Jesus Christ. And as we evangelize in our personal conversations, in any teaching, preaching, the name of Jesus Christ and the keys of the kingdom. So we look at this great pattern for our preaching that is given. We think about other various scriptures. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 2, I touched on that this morning. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort, but do it with complete patience and teaching. So we have the tools that we need. So like we talked about uh, this morning, that when, when Moses was approached and he made excuses, that we don't really have excuses. What we're being asked to do may at times seem difficult, but ultimately it, it is relatively simple. We have the tools at hand to become equipped. We study the Word of God. We have it just the way He wants it, the way He orchestrated it. And it's merely our responsibility to present it. But if we get all complicated in our mind and discombobulated in our mind, we can boil it all down and sift it all out and go back to these two points that when we're trying to share with others, we do not need to beat around the bush. We do not need to bow down. We do not need to take a different stance that ultimately what is important 
is the power and authority of the name of Jesus Christ and recognizing that that is the key to the kingdom of God. Preach the faith we learn in Jude chapter 3. It says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach the good news. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. Again Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. See, Jesus came and he served as a cornerstone and he united us all. So the power and the authority of the name of Jesus is to unite us all. He came to establish his church, his way, in his time, with his conditions. Now note some similarities here. Acts chapter 8 verse 12. But when they believed, this is what we, we heard earlier. But when they believed, Philip as he preached, good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ... Then they were baptized, both the men and the women. Acts 28 and 23, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him and his lodging in great numbers. From morning till evening he expounded to them, testifying of the kingdom, trying to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and also from the prophets. How about Acts 28 and 31? Proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Now folks, again, any time that the Bible has repetition and patterns like this, it's meant for us to get it. It's meant for us not to miss it. These aren't notes I made up. These are direct scriptures from the Word of God that I've simply compiled and put together and brought for you to consider. The kingdom of God and the name of Jesus go hand in hand over and over again throughout the Word of God. Just like Peter in Acts 2.38, again, in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 2 and 47, praising God and having favor with all people, the Lord added to their number day by day those that were being saved. Matthew 16, 18 through 19, talking of the kingdom of God. And I tell you, you are Peter. I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of God. It's over and over and over again. John 3, 3 through 5, unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. It's conditional. doesn't matter what you want. It's what you do. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's what the scriptures say. The commandments are clear that we need to believe. We need to repent. We need to confess. We need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in order to enter the kingdom of God. So just as Dow asked this morning in Bible study, uh, you know, if a sick man's been sick for 38 years and you ask, would you like to be healed? It's a rhetorical or a no-brainer. You would expect him to say yes. Well, if I ask you tonight, do you want to spend eternity? Eternity in heaven or in hell? I would expect a certain answer. But what will be your response? How will you take the message? You must be born again. You must obey. It's conditional. So tonight, please allow this lesson to take three, three points, but to drive two home. That when we think about our responsibility as evangelists, when we think about what to say and what to present, that we focus on what has been working since the church was established in the very beginning that we take and emphasize the importance, the power, the prerogative, and the authority of the name of Jesus Christ and help folk to understand that that is ultimately the key to the kingdom of God. Without him, no man will find the Father. He will judge us. He will judge us rightly by what we've been given. 
It's the perfect law. We understood that from this morning's lesson. So tonight, ask yourself, have I obeyed? Have I been born again? Have I followed those instructions? Are there things that we could encourage you with? Maybe you struggle with evangelism, which has been the focus of this morning and this evening. We can help you with that as well. Prayer can be incredibly encouraging. We can work with you on an individual basis. We have very, very qualified members. Very, very good deacons, very, very good elders, very, very mature Christians in our audience who would love to study with you, help you become more equipped. But again, when you find yourself stumbling, when you find yourself struggling, focus on the power of Jesus. Focus on the keys to the kingdom. And I think you'll be a better evangelist. If there's anything that we can help you with tonight, won't you come as we stand and as we sing?